<laughs> well, uh, I'm going to introduce Mickey, but before I introduce Mickey, I want to give her something. Because she wasn't able to be at the opening, Mickey doesn't know that there's a coveted award that goes with this that the winners get, and only the jurors. And only a few people have ever received this. Tom Stanley designed <gasps> awards. Have you heard about this? Is it my artistic license? <laughs> so from this point on, if somebody said, have you ever juried a show? You can say, not only have I juried a show, I have a certificate of excellence of superior jury. Oh my gosh. <laughs> With your name and our name, it's a certificate. So, so I love yeah, that so because, you can, thank you. Yeah. Tom also gives um, artistic licenses out. So you have artistic license, which I think is really great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, and Dane and, uh, and Tom. I think uh, I have a picture of him up in this PowerPoint. Okay, okay. Well, uh, the day that we, we judge the show, I know Mitch and Evelyn worked in there, and they all know how hard she worked that day and how clear and focused she was at doing that. It was a real treat. Uh, and I, I would encourage you all to go down and see what she does at the Forum. Mickey's been the executive director of the Contemporary Arts Forum for seven years, coming up in January. And during her tenure, she's established a broad and lively range of exhibitions, programs, and lectures from shows with internationally known artists such as Sandra Biggers, to the noted Forum Lounge performance events, and to the upcoming pumpkin carving competition. Yeah, and if you don't know about that, she can tell you about that. But prior to this, she worked at the Public Art Fund in New York uh, from 2001 to 2004. And from 99 to 2001, she was a curatorial associate at the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego. And she's uh, her degree is actually from uh, the University of Austin, Texas. It's a master's degree in contemporary Latin American art, which she's published in a number of scholarly reviews. And so we please welcome Mickey Garcia. Hello. Can anybody hear me? Did we, tr did we test this? Did I turn it? Do I need to turn it on? If she hears me. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Okay. Everybody else can hear me fine? Great. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Dane, for asking me to jury this show. This is, uh, I mean, it's a pleasure. I'm actually jurying something right now for the Jerome Foundation in Minnesota, and um, the work here is better. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but it's really exciting, and, you know, um, I, I, I do have a long um, background in art history, but I, I want to just tell you guys all a little bit more about my, my background, only in that um, I, I am what a lot of people refer to as an art baby. My father got his MFA, and I grew up in art studios and galleries, and my mother is an artist and has been part of the Brownsville Museum of Art docents, and she belongs to the Brownsville Art Association, and so these kinds of um, juror, juror jury prizes and things are not only things that my dad and mom helped set up, but that I kind of have always grown up going to. So it's just fabulous. It's really gratifying for me as an adult to be able to still do things like this. It's really exciting. My parents would be proud. Um, or maybe not. My mom didn't speak for me to me for two weeks after I declared art history as a major. She wanted me to be a lawyer, but um, I think she's okay with it now. Anyway, um, w before I get started with the actual PowerPoint presentation, I think that uh, Dane asked me to speak on anything I wanted to speak on, and there were a range of topics that I regularly lecture on. As Dane mentioned, I've worked in the public art sphere and um, have a master's in Latin American art, um, but I, I've also worked in contemporary art making practices for, for a long time, and so it, it really, it, it, I was really confused as where to, where, what to talk to you guys about. But you know, um, this Friday, which is in a couple of days, we have um, our call for entries, which is a, an open pro call process where we ask artists from the tri-counties to uh, submit their work. Um, and then a, 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 a panel of jurors um, selects a few artists, and then those artists get an exhibition at CAF with a publication. And as uh, part of that, I also do portfolio reviews during that month that we have the call for entries um, where I meet with artists who are members for 20 minutes, one-on-one. -on -one. And I also give these artist survival strategies, which I think some of you have been to, which I lovingly call ass. I give some ass class. 
<laughs> it's hot outside. Um, but uh, a lot of what we do at CAF, and I just want to give you an introduction of to, to what CAF is, is it um, is really advocate for the role for the artist in our time for the living for living artists. There's this crazy um, statistic that was put out a few years ago by USA Artists and. Um, people were asked if they valued the role, if they valued the arts in their lives, and overwhelmingly 90% of those asked said, of course, they valued the arts in their lives. When they asked if they valued artists in their lives, and we're talking about poets, dancers, visual artists, 23% said they valued artists in their lives. So I think that that, that speaks to a lot of different things, but one of it is um, I feel like uh, coming from uh, a place like CAF is that I think there's a lot of mystery and mis mystifying um, things that come when when one talks about about artists or arts in, in our time and think um, there's a sense that um, you have to know a certain amount or you have to have you know make a certain amount or you have to be a certain kind of uh, class in order to enjoy and understand art and that's just simply not true and what we do at, at the at the arts forum is really work on behalf of um, the arts of our time and really support the artist in many many ways we give them exhibitions we um, teach professionalism classes we're there to give support and advice we give recommendations there's various ways where we um, act um, as a support for, for artists in the community. We're a non-collecting institution. It's called a Kunsthalle in, in Europe. It basically it means that we are a space or a site that is more interested in developing new work with artists or showing work that hasn't been shown, like maybe it's just in the artist studio or just shown once before, um, shown to wider audiences and to working with artists who are some, sometimes emerging or sometimes mid-career artists um, or established artists who kind of deserve a different, um, you know, a critical recognition. Um, so that's that's what we do. Um, the reason why I decided to focus on the role of the curator, as you can see here, is because I don't know about you, but when I was in college, even though I had my, you know, foot in the art door from the time I was born, I didn't really know what a curator was. Do, does anybody know what a curator is? here, like could really sit and talk, except for Dane, can talk to me about what the role of a curator is? That's interesting that you say that, uh, uh, because I so happen to have a 45 minute lecture on that. No, I think that um, the, the reason I ask that is because, you know, I, I talk to students a lot, especially young artists, and I'm always saying to them, you know, you really have to know your community. You have to be involved with, um, the arts of your time and I you know I said to this group of seniors uh, last year and I said you know you guys are going off and you're gonna be you know you want to be an art art school how many of you guys have been to Culver City to the galleries how many of y'all can oh there you go how many of you um, you know read art forum how many of you know 50 artists off the top of your head how many of you know have been to a museum you know like a contemporary art museum in the last month and you know it was low, disturbingly low, and I thought, God, you know, if you were going off to, to get a basketball scholarship, you would know every single basketball player, you would know every single coach, you would know the history of basketball. Why don't you think it's the same for you as, art, as artists? Why wouldn't you know your community? This idea of like working in isolation is going to not get you very far. Um, and I think that on top of that, I think a lot of artists, even established artists really have no idea what a curator does and yet artists in order to get their work into the into the public realm really need to rely on a, a, a whole interdependent network of people whether it's gallerists or collectors or curators or um, uh, auctioneers or you know um, art dealers there are so many people that artists need to interact with and when you don't even know what they do again that's really gonna put you at odds and I'm not blaming anybody for not knowing because I think that what the problem is is that there's just not a lot of avenues for us to learn that I, I the 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 one thing I do remember is I don't know how many of you guys have read um, uh, gosh, what is it called? I have it on my thing because I always forget it, but I, um, from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frank Frankweiler. Did, did you love that? Did you love that? It's a, it's a children's book where these, um, 
little kids, two a brother and sister, steal away to the Metropolitan Museum of Art for a week. They they get away because they don't think their parents appreciate them, and they're at the Met, and they like stay in all the period rooms, and they go on all the tours. And I saw that. I mean, I read that book, and I have to tell you, I started like curating little shows in my garage. I was just so excited. I, I but I didn't other than like that book, I would never have known how what a curator does. So I think that what today what I want to give you guys is just a background um, some background information about what my job entails and how I relate to you as artists. I'm assuming most people here are artists or studying art. Um, how I relate to you so that you can have a sense of it. You know um, who decides how an exhibit of uh, artwork should be shown to the public or what particular style should be highlighted? Such important and creative decisions are made by the museum curator. Curator is responsible for selecting the artwork to be featured and arranging it in displays that are both appealing and informative. This job is challenging and yet fun. I was getting a little, okay, so anyway. Um, a curator, um, this is really just the basics of what a curator um, does is, my space is a non-collecting institution, but most museums that you go to will have permanent collections. And so a curator is, um, uh, is a person who cares for the institution's collections and their collection catalogs. The object of a curator's concern necessarily involves tangible objects of some sort, whether it be art, collectibles, historic items, or scientific collections. So there's curators at the Natural History Museum, there's curators at uh, the zoo, and there's curators at art museums. The role of the curator will encompass collecting objects, making provisions for the effective preservation, conservation, interpretation, documentation, and catalog uh, research and exhibition display of the collection to make them accessible to the public. The thing that you need to know about what museum curators do is that they work with objects and um, they are really the conduit. They are the, the museum and the curator in particular is really the person that is between the artist and the public. And a lot of times we, we really want to protect the artist in a lot of ways. We want them to think in the most obscure, at the highest level, at the most experimental way. But we al also know that we want the public who maybe doesn't have the greatest art history background, doesn't know what you know contemporary art is, we want them to have resonant experiences when they walk into a museum. So it's really our job to kind of interpret what the artist is doing to a larger audience and really kind of protect both both of our constituents. Oh, oh sorry. That's I forgot to ask you for the lights. Um, so my job as well as Dane's really revolves around exhibitions. We're visual art curators, contemporary art curators, and so we're really um, the thing that we do is we decide what our exhibition will be. And um, this is just a picture of the Contemporary Arts Forum. How many people have been there? Oh, yay, okay. So uh, many of you know where, where, we, where we hold it. Um, and this is just to give you a little background. You know, um, a lot of times people will say, well, I'm gonna curate a show. And that's it's really nice, but I think that really there is a skill and um, uh, a discipline to to organizing exhibitions and it's not just how things, you know, I once had a, a emerging artist say to me, well, you're just a decorator. I love him actually to this day, but um, it, we're not, we're not, you know, you see those movies where like, oh, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, you know, I mean, it seems as though our jobs are really to just make the rooms look pretty. But in fact, when we are working with objects and we're working with artists and we're working with spaces and thinking about audiences, there's really a, a lot of, of consideration that goes into really preparing an exhibition that you're gonna walk in to see at a particular museum. So we don't just you know, reach into a, 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 tux, you know, a big top hat and then be like, I'm gonna do an exhibition on Greek statuary. You know, uh, m many of us have, have focuses and we do a lot of, ex um, you know, we have a lot of education in the particular 
subject matter that we have, and then we also have an ongoing education and a ton of research. And I would say that on the average, when you're in your studio every day, you know, painting or making work, um, I'm in my office um, reading four newspapers a day and three art journals, and I am constantly, you know, I don't usually have the luxury of reading fiction. I'm usually reading art theory and um, more art history. I have a master's degree in in all, you know, it, you know, it starts with the cave paintings at Lascaux all the way up to now and have gotten a master's, many people get PhDs, in really understanding what art means. And w w when I say this is, you know, sometimes when you look at a work of art as, as an artist, you're really, I, I've done studio visits with artists and it's really great to do them with artists. You're looking at the, you know, what the, what the texture is or what the process was or why this person selected this palette or why this scale. Um, a curator from is looking at work also in that way for sure, but they're also looking at work from a historical or sociological way. So like for example, does anybody know who the futurists are? Marinetti and you know, um, these were uh, people that were painting in the, at the turn of the 1800s, early 1900s actually. And they were, like there's a painting of this one, I'm sorry I didn't bring it, um, there's a painting of this woman walking her dog and the dog has like, it looks like the dog is going like this, you know, it's all these brush strokes. In and of itself, it's a painting of a dog, right? But for my, my job as an, art, as an art curator and an art historian is to say, wow, these guys, this was during, right around the Industrial Age. The Industrial Revolution was happening. And there were, um, this is also around the time that the f photograph was invented and people could see blurs in photography. Wow, the relativity was right around that time. This is what's influencing those artists. So it's not that I'm looking at this work as a standalone discrete object, I'm looking at it in how, how it is a mirror and how it responds to the cultural phenomena that's happening at the time. And that's basically what I do now. That's how I put exhibitions together. I'll be like, wow, there's a lot of artists, you know, who don't have ceramics backgrounds who are coming out of like, you know, MFA art schools and they're all using ceramics. What's all that about? And so then I start putting together some exhibitions and some theories. So in terms of research, it's not, you know, a lot of us who are behind that are not simply picking art. We're really looking at the field. Travel and field work. Another thing that I um, constantly do along with fellow curators is I'm constantly traveling, uh, much to my boyfriend's dismay. <laughs> <laughs> but and, and my own health. But um, there's uh, there's a a reason why we travel. It's it, it's we're we're constantly looking at museums. We're looking at the way new other museums are displaying. Oh, that's how they show video. Oh, we could show video that way. Oh, that's how they did this. Um, that's what they do with their labels. This is what they do with their signage. But also the idea of looking at a lot of art is really important, and also looking at other museums and looking at other exhibitions. Sometimes as you guys go, grow up in the field, you'll, um, an artist will see an exhibition that will be so impactful to them. And sometimes a group of artists will see an exhibition. This exhibition meant so much, like say the street art exhibition at MoCA, a lot of you guys know. A lot of young kids have, are going to see that, young artists, and that exhibition is gonna be super impactful on them. I need to go see that because as these kids grow, grow into their studio practice and I'm gonna be going to these studio visits, I'll have need, needed that as a reference. So when I travel to Venice or a couple weeks, last month I was in Istanbul for a biennial for a big art fair, or as I travel to Miami um, for an art, art fairs and biennials, I'm taking this as kind of an index of what's going on in the world, what's happening, what are the important um, things in art that are going on that I need to be aware of. And then studio visits. There's Tom. Do you see him on the right hand side there? Um, studio visits. This is kind of uh, uh, my daily practice. You know, like a trader just trades stocks every day. That's kind of what I do. I do studio visit upon studio visit upon studio visit upon studio visit, and I can't say it, I can say it 20 more times and still not enough. Um, what I do is um, whether I'm here or traveling, 
I am constantly in artist studios. That is, you know, if I was uh, a curator of orchids, I really wouldn't know very much about orchids if I stayed in my office. I'd have to go into the field. I'd have to go to the jungles of Brazil and Africa to really find where the, the orchids are. Same thing with me. I have to go into the field to find artists and to see what they're saying. A lot of the times, you know, I want to pause right here because those of you who have been to the artist survival strategies, you, you guys really know, and, and, and especially for those of you who entered small images and may or may not have been selected, um, the great thing about studio visits is that they are really meant to be conversations for you. As artists, you know, a lot, it, this is not American Idol, as I was telling Dane. So many artists I know, they're like, oh, well, she came to my studio and she didn't select me, so she doesn't like my work. And this is not a, a, an audition process. This is, does not work like that. The way that studio visits are for is for you to invite friends, artists, collectors, anybody to really give you a sense of information about what your own practice is about. And I always use an example like, say you just keep painting green and green and green and you're just painting it and you're thinking, oh, the landscape and you know the earth and stuff. Someone comes in here and is like, wow, you're really painting a lot of green and it kind of looks horizontal. What are you painting, money or something? You know, is this, does this involve greed? And then you go, oh wow, I never really thought about that. Maybe I am painting. You know? And then you yourself can dig deeper into your own practice in terms of why are you doing this? Why are you choosing these colors? Why are you making these decisions? Why the scale, why not? So when you have people over to your studio, you're beginning a real growth and journey into what your own work is about. So I would really encourage artists not to look at studio visits, because you should have them all the time. I mean, like, all the time. Um, not to look at them as, like, these one-way A to Z points. I mean, I Sanford Biggers, who, who Dane mentioned, we had a solo show with his of his work last year, and now he's got a big show at the Brooklyn Museum of Art and some other places. I did studio visits with him for 10 years. He applied to one of our call for entries in New York when I was there and didn't get accepted. And 10 years later, still from the dialogue, I was it, he was in a moment where he really needed some support. Nothing had been written about his work. We, I was looking at, um, you know, in my program, looking at uh, a solo exhibition, and it, and it worked perfectly. And um, he gets a solo exhibition and his first mu major museum catalog out of that. Now, if he had been thinking, oh, well, she came to my studio, and oh, she rejected me in this thing, you know, he, he could have written me off and, and never had that. Not to mention, I see a work at, at Small Images and then I go and tell a collector or I tell a friend of mine, oh my gosh, you've got to go down there and see this. Now, you would never have known that. Or if I go to a studio visit and somebody calls me up and say, hey, I'm doing a work on like, you know, um, water. I'm doing an exhibition on water, Mickey. Do you know any artists who are, you know, have water as a theme? Then I can say, oh yeah, there's this one person I just visited last week. So it really is about building your network um, for me as well. For me as well as, as for you guys. Um, I think that I can't stress it enough that um, the, the myth of art you know, as you like in your studio and it's the solitary practice and I can't do business because I've got an artist mind. It, it, that's a myth. It's never happened. If you look at Picasso and those guys hanging out in Paris, they were together all the time going out, hanging, putting their work in the salons, pe putting their hands out to collectors. They were not, you know, just hanging out in their studio, not, not being affected by the world. That, that, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, you could choose to do that, and like, you know, maybe if you die, somebody will discover you, but I, I would say probably the other way is a little bit better. And then, you know, just think about, uh, when I think about uh, working as a curator, you know, Dane doesn't just say, hey, he doesn't just walk, you know, saddle up to some studio and be like, you're a genius, I'm going to show you. Uh, Dane and myself are looking at, I look at a whole year. And I think, okay, I've been around the world and I've seen these many studios. What's happening in the world that I'm going to bring to, to CAF, to Santa Barbara, to my audience? What does my audience want to see? What is going to help the artist in my town? What is going to help the audiences in my, my location? And so I then look at a year of exhibitions, like maybe four exhibitions a year, and I think, okay, well, I want it to be diverse in media. I don't want to just show video every single time. 
like me, I, I love sculpture. That's what I love. I mean, if I showed the art I liked at CF, I'd, I'd have been fired like the first year. <laughs> but I don't show art that I like or that is genius. I show work that is responsible to my, my public. So maybe I'm going to have some painting, some video, some installation, maybe one group show, what, maybe one solo show. Maybe I'm going to have something that is kind of crazy and off the wall and something that's a little quieter and elegant. And these things work with each other. So it's not, you know, when someone is selecting an exhibition or selecting you for a show, there's so many other things to be, that this person is considering. And some of the things, you know, I mean, if you ever wanted to curate um, or, you know, organize your friends in a show, another thing I always tell artists is like, don't be complaining that there's no places to show because you can always, and I know uh, many people who've cleared out their garage or cleared out their living room and hung art on their living room and invited all their friends through Evite and then they had a show that they could put on their resume. Grace, Gracie Mansions started out in her bathroom. Started out in a bathroom. Sarah Meltzer started out in her living room. So many, you know, people. Those guys, Joe Shea and, um, you know, the guys that do, like, the painting thing at, at the Presidio, they started out doing painting parties at their garage and people and throwing a DJ together. You know, that this is uh, it's a very proactive kind of thing. But if you ever did, I mean, these are kind of the things that we would consider. Right? So, making plans. So let's say I went around the world and I did a bajillion studio visits and then I thought about what I wanted to do. Then I need to make plans. And I, um, one of the things that we do is um, uh, go to other museums and borrow, borrow things. Like for example, I, ha I showed, a, 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 it was a two person show, a painter in London and a painter in New York. Well, I didn't have a lot of money, so from the guy, you know, and the shipping and building crates and things for the painting to come from London, lots of paintings to come from London would have cost me a fortune. So I went and I was like, okay, so this person has a lot of collectors in LA. So let me see who in LA has some of the paintings that I want so I can send my guys up there in a truck and bring it over here. And all of a sudden I have a show from England that came from LA. So those are the kinds of things, I, and I'm you know, out in LA and I'm looking, you know, I have to go into these people's racks and see if the work is good and do all of that stuff. So a lot of times we're making these plans, we're borrowing from museums, we're borrowing from collectors. And then we plan out how the exhibition will look. Um, sometimes we work with a designer, like sometimes I will go to an architecture firm or a group of architects and ask them to design and lay out some of the plans. A lot of museums, like SBMA, has an exhibition design uh, department, and that's another great uh, career as well, doing exhibition design. There, that um, A lot of times architects um, will, will go into exhibition design. Um, we think about how many display cases we need, how they fit, emergency exits, um, you know, what the pedestals are going to look like. We're really thinking about every single part of the story that we're, we're trying to tell the, um, the audience. Of course, my least favorite part of the job, and I think Dave might <laughs> say that it was maybe his least too, is fundraising. We work for non nonprofits. As a curator, uh, most of the time um, you work for a not-for-profit institution. One of the great things about a not-for-profit museum and not-for-profit institution is that we're not although it's really changed it since the 70s and 80s, particularly the 80s, but if we are a non-profit museum and we're not looking to make a profit, most museums are non-profit, then that means that we are not reliant on the market to dictate what we can show and what we can't show. So a gallery, for instance, is for profit. They want to make money. So if you are an artist and you've been making these beautiful paintings of sunflowers and those sunflowers they sell like hotcakes but all of a sudden you want to change direction and you want to make yellow string pieces in the corner that gallery's not going to let you do that because they're not going to sell that and they don't really want you to do that museums on the other hand are interested in like not that galleries are not but we're interested in the ideas in the process in the in the creation so we're we don't have to make a profit we're not selling any of your work as a matter of fact, we usually give you the money to make your work and then you can keep it. So a lot of the times what we're interested in is really 
really supporting the highest level of thinking, the highest level of visual practice um, for for now, but for the future, for you know the Picassos of tomorrow, those kinds of things. So we're not interested, and that really gives us a certain freedom. The reason why I say that's really controversial now is because fundraising means that I have to go to a corporation or a donor, and they want to see certain things. So if you're, you know, Philip Morris is giving you money, you're going to maybe need to be aware of what Philip Morris's agenda is. Or if McDonald's is going to give you money, then you might need to, you know, adjust your exhibition to a McDonald's's agenda. So um, fundraising is really tricky. Um, with the Mocha show, for example, um, that street art show was the biggest exhibition Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles ever had. It had so many people. And fundraising-wise, for the director, you know, he is just like, everybody is lauding him, he's great. Now from curatorial minds like myself, he got rid of a Jack Goldstein retrospective to have that show. Now, a lot of you guys may not know who Jack Goldstein is and you might know who Mr. Brainwash is, but in my mind, I cannot believe he got rid of that Jack Goldstein show because that artist is amazing. He's Southern Californian, he deserves uh, retrospective. There hasn't been in important scholarly work on him and MOCA should be the museum to do it. But that's not going to bring people in. So guess what wins? The street art show. So these are the kinds of things that we're looking at behind the scenes. Is What does the public want? What is the, good for the art? And always measuring one against the other. So then we make changes to the gallery. This is really exciting. We work with installers and preparators. How many of you guys have ever installed or prepared your own shows and worked with them? It's really important to work with installers too. I think this is a really great. They um, are the engineers, basically. You know, they'll be like, no, you cannot hang 5,000 balloons from the, you know, lead balloons from this. The ceiling's going to break. Because in your mind, you know, and curators will also be like, yeah, do it. Yeah, you know, you want to do that? Yeah, sure, let's do it. And then the installer's like, no, hell no, this is not going to work. So it's really important, the practice of, of, of um, um, practice of making exhibitions, even if you're not invited to a museum, for you to make exhibitions in different places, it's going to help you understand hanging art, placing art. What does that mean? So installers. Uh, then we often get, um, we, we usually work with um, artists and bring them to Santa Barbara to make work that really responds to the site so that as they go off into their careers, they will always have a, a part of Santa Barbara as part of their story and narrative and then CAF lives on in that way. Um, then of course we create the, it's like always like Christmas, it's my favorite thing to do if my job is once I've selected the work, once we've looked at the design, once I've figured out the budget and raised the funds, then the artwork comes in. And it is, it's, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years and I still get goosebumps when the artwork comes in. I just get so, so excited. Um, then we have, mar we work with, with marketing departments as curators. We have to help them write the press release, you know, get the newspaper out. We want people to come see all of the hard work and, you know, ha support the artists. And, you know, the museums have banners, they have bus stations, they have member swap days, they have press conferences. This is a little snapshot of our page that we do with social media. It's, um... You know, we are not only the sort of behind the scenes, but we're also kind of like at the front lines of uh, seeing what, what that is. And then with the education and interpretation, we have an uh, education department. So they basically, curators and educators always have this like really difficult time. You know how they have difficult times with the fundraisers because the fundraisers are like, it doesn't matter if Target wants you to slap Target all over the artwork, just do it. We're going to get $125,000, and so the curator pushes back. No, 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 the artist doesn't want that. And then with the education person, they'll be like, uh, this is about pretty colors. And then I'll be like, no, it's not. The artist said it's about blah, 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 blah. So I push back with the education person because they want to make it as readable as possible to the layman. And I still want to be like, no, no, let's make it a little bit more complicated. So I'm always working. I mean, the curator is kind of like a hand in all pots because you're working with the education to try to be like, okay, I know that maybe they won't understand, you know, Foucault's theory of the body, but maybe they will understand 
abstract art. You know, so then we're kind of looking at that. But we really, what we really want at CAF is to be able to create a space where you can come in and not know anything and walk away with something that has resonated within your own experiences and that you can um, tie to your own. And of course, then there's always the party. The thing about the art world is that it is so social, social beyond belief. I mean, if you want to make a connection with other people, you have to go to openings. I mean, Stephanie, how many parties do you go to in your lifetime that you don't want to go to? And you're like, I got to get dressed up and I got to go say, shake hands. I'm an animal. She's an ant. She's part of animal. <laughs> but, you know, part of that is going there. You want to meet other artists. You want to meet other curators. And it always happens at the opening. It happens at the after party. Um, there is constantly, like, you know, galleries all have openings. There is cause for celebration. In a lot of ways, what we do, given that statistic that I, 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 I showed, you know, what we do, what artists and people in the nonprofit world, like museum curators, educators, installers, we're not doing this because we want to make a million dollars. We're not doing this because we, um, you know, um, have that desire to own a yacht. We are doing this as a labor of love, and I think that I can speak for my colleagues here. It's a vocation. I, I can't do, I can't not do this. And I think most artists that are good artists can't not be artists. And we sacrifice, you know, uh, you know, we could have all gone to Goldman Sachs. We could have all gone to get our MBAs, but we didn't because we knew that that wasn't our path. And so in a lot of ways, the celebration of the kind of hard time that, that it is to be an artist really is um, exuberant. And you can really feel it at openings. We're just like, yay, we finally did it, you know. And um, it's, it's a really exciting time. Then finally, what we what we do is um, we publish, and that is you know I was my boyfriend has a 17 year old and a 15 year old, and I was sitting there at the dining room table yesterday was, uh, last week because I had an essay due for a publication, and I was like I, I'm almost 40 and I still can't you know get away from homework like I'm still doing homework at 40. But the idea is that um, what we also do is we don't just present work that's in the gallery because that that will be six eight weeks and then it goes away but what we want to do is really have a, 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 a genuine contribution to the field we want the work that we do to outlive not just the space the geography of santa barbara um, so that it can live to other audiences but to to, to live other audiences in the future so that what we do the marks that we're making now are really part of an overall story of art that we are all living in. And so it's really important. A lot of times CAF is sometimes the first to write something about the artists that we're showing because we show a lot of emerging artists. And again, like this show here, Michelle O'Mara, she's actually not an emerging artist. She's been working for a long time and we had a solo show. And I wrote the essay for her, lots of research. You know, I had to go away and like hide in a cabin because it's really hard to you know, when you're fundraising and stuff like that, you, you just, and I, wa and, I, and I wrote this essay and she wrote, you know, she, she emailed me back. She's like, I didn't even know I did that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because I was like, oh, this is like really interesting. You know, the pictures generation, you're kind of like Cindy Sherman and Richard Prince and blah, blah, blah. She's like, really? I didn't know that was, I didn't know I was like that. And so a lot of times you're so involved with your own practice that it's really not for you to be like, oh, I'm like Richard Prince or I am like that person. It's for me to make those observations. So um, uh, curators really need to work hand in hand with, with artists so that artists can do their work and we can do ours and it really benefits, benefits the audience that we serve. Just really quickly, Ed, I might need your help. Okay, um, so what we're presenting in, I just wanted to show you, I wanted to do a little PR for um, this show. Um, it's called Flights from Wonder and it, start, it starts in, um, February. Okay, before you start reading, I have, I, I was working with this artist and she uh, was doing a, a, a site specific, which means she was making an artwork in somebody's home. And we showed her the home and the, and the people that own the home said, she can do anything she wants, but I just want you to know that there's a four-year-old living here. So just, you know, could she respect that? She can do anything. 
and the artist, her name is Kirsten Stoltman, she was like, oh, I have a four-year-old. And she was, and then she's like, I'm gonna make an artwork for this four-year-old. And the artwork was as though like a four-year-old had just like taken a bunch of art supplies and then just went crazy in the living room and like painted the walls. It was, it's pretty awesome. But, but she was telling me, um, Kirsten was telling me that she just loves the way her child looks at the world. And she's like, you know, I went and bought her these really expensive stickers. And like the moment we got home, she took off this, you know, she took out the packaging and then she started putting one sticker right on top of the other. <laughs> and she was like, you're ruining it. And from, but from her daughter's perspective, she, wa she wasn't ruining it. She was playing. I mean, it was, it totally made sense. And I, I loved that notion and it stuck with me for a long time. And then I was reading this quote too from uh, these, I was reading some Albert Einstein, you know, in my time off. I was reading just a little Albert Einstein. Um, he was talking about, you know, um, the pursuit of truth and beauty is a sphere of activity in which we are permitted to remain children all our lives. And the process of scientific discovery is in effect a continual flight from wonder. And I thought about those ideas and then I thought about the story that Kirsten had told me and I thought, God, you know, Buddha, Einstein, Proust, they're always saying like, please put, a, put away your adult preoccupations and fears. And if you approached life as a child, then that would lead you to deeper discoveries. And I thought, gosh, you know, that's really the way science, scientists work and the, really the way artists work. When they go in there, they, they approach their process from such this, this place where, what if? What if I did this? What if, you know, and I really wanted to challenge my audience to work like that too. Because so many times we're like, oh, this is contemporary art. I don't get this. How much, how much is this? I could do that. All of those things. Like, what if you just went in there and were a child? And so that's my challenge to my audience. And so I'm just going to show you some of the, the artists. This is um, an artist named Chris Chiappa. And these are called stool samples. <laughs> I love it. They're stools. They're um, the actual stools you can sit on, and they'll be throughout the gallery. And they um, are really inspired by Weber gas grills. You know those little, um, and they started from a, a grill. Uh, then there is Liz Craft, who's making a bunch of these hairy guys with binoculars in bronze. Um, then there is Martha Friedman, who's got this uh, gigantic <laughs> macaroni necklace uh, that we all love called Noodle. We're working with a group from Miami called Friends With You that does, I think we might have a bouncy house in the gallery for adults um, that works with installations like this. Um, we are working with John Plipchuk um, and it's called, I don't have the personal strength to take that extra step and put the lights out once and for all. Um. And um, uh, this is Carolyn Salas, who's more interested in the back of the frame than the front of the frame. And uh, Mindy Shapiro who works a lot with <laughs> rainbows and colors. Um, Shanique Smith who works with found objects and a lot of um, dolls and fabrics and textiles. And then Phoebe Washburn who um, sets a, a lot of her work up like a lab, like a laboratory where all these like wild experiments happen and um, uses a lot of discarded sort of scrap, scrap, scraps. Anyway, so that's kind of the show I'm working on now, but um, you'll hear more about it, I'm sure. And I would love to take questions. Did I go too long? Okay. When you get to set up a show like that, what degree of that is your own kind of free choice and to what degree is there a collaborative process where you need approval of, from some authority? Um, I have a board of trustees who, um, there is a committee, a program committee, uh, but their job is to govern, not to manage. And so what that means is that they make sure that the shows that I'm doing are fiscally responsible, so I'm not doing a $500,000 show, mm -hmm. and um, adhere to the mission. Mm -hmm. So as long as they do that, I have uh, curatorial control. If you don't mind, I have two questions. Sure. Um, one is that it seems, uh, based on your presentation, that uh, your job requires um, you to be critical of work and to kind of have to be discerning. So do you think that um, the roles of art critic and curators is kind of separated by a distinct line or that it's more of a spectrum? Um, I think that 
when I go to say a gallery, like a gallery show in Chelsea, um, I am looking at the arc of that artist's career. So I'm like, oh, this is an interesting development or whatever. And, and yes, I'll be incredibly critical about like what I think that person has made. But I think an art critic is looking at that work, but like sort of, is this work successful and how is it, um, how is it better or worse than the field? Um, or how, what is its position? And for me, you know, when I, when a critic or a gallerist, for example, goes into an artist's studio, they're very like upfront. They're like, oh, you shouldn't use this color. This is, th these sizes are way too big. For me, it's all about like, why did you do this? More like a wonder because I'm not there to tell anybody what to do. I'm here to observe. Um, so it's a little bit more maybe distant on my end. Her observations of the um, pieces that were selected for the small images show. Uh-huh. Um, how, you know, how do the pieces there to you fit into like our cultural context? And yeah. We're, we're provincial, we're local. And how do you see us fitting into the yeah, it's interesting, you know, because I just mentioned that I'm doing um, some jurying for this, uh, for, for local artists in Minnesota, for this fellowship. And it's fascinating because what I, what I see, for, for me, what I take away from the small images is just how artists here are interested in landscape, how they're interested in light, the conditions of light, how they're interested in assemblage, um, how certain Sort of, sort of uh, certain color schemes that Santa Barbara artists tend to work in versus like Minnesota, it's gray there, right? There's so, min so much gray. There's a lot of um, work that I've been seeing in this jury that is a document documentary and it's really documenting like, like the disappearing middle class. The, the Minnesota one. So when I can look at art like that versus what Santa Barbara, there's not a lot of documentary work here because Santa Barbara has a particular character and so the work that's being made here is usually addressing as a whole is usually addressing things that are maybe more spiritual or environmental things like that that just happen out of that's where we live this is where we live this is what we respond to exactly yeah, or China, you know. But I think Minnesota is a good contrast because it's they're responding to the industrial, in, you know, like this kind of like breakdown of like industrial towns and yeah, the whole Northwest. yeah, yeah. And you can see it. I mean, they're not trying to be like that. That's what they see around them. So that's what they're working with. But I think also with the small images show, you know, a lot of times an artist will come into their my, you know, my portfolio or they'll. Um, I'll do a studio visit and they'll be like, so, is it good? Do you like it? Am I, am I good? And I'm like, I don't know, are you? Do you think you, because again, like with the crit, as a critic, uh, uh, it's not my job to say whether you're good or not. It's my job to see whether you, your work resonates or it fits in with what I'm working on. Um, that quality of good or bad, it's like, do you like Miles J Davis's, you know, uh, Bitches Brew? I mean, you might like it, you might not like it, you, but you can understand it without, you know, there, it's just like this visceral thing. And so with small images, I refer that, you know, I, I tried to select a real diversity of what was happening here, you know, from what I saw, and then really look at those who are approaching their medium in really imaginative ways or refreshing ways or ways I hadn't really thought before. Um, and. And so that's more what I'm, I'm not looking at like, is this good or is this bad? Is this good or is this bad? I'm looking at more like, oh, I, wow, this woodcut I've never seen. Not a lot of people are working in woodcut right now. And isn't this an interesting image to, I wonder what made that person select of all the images in the world, that image. Already I'm having a discussion with it. I like it. You know, that's the kind of conversation I'm having. Um, it seems that kind of the protocol now is that it's inappropriate to walk into a gallery space or something like that and just pull yes. up your portfolio. Yes, so it is. Other than the open call opportunities, how would you suggest that we go about getting our work seen? Who went to the Artist Survival Strategies? I have one word for that. What was it, what was it that, how, how you suggest getting your work seen? <laughs> your friends. Network. Networking. No, no cold packages. Yeah, you know how I found out about my job opportunities? My friends. 
Do you know how I find out about like who's doing what? My friends. Um, that you're, if you are rightly situated in your community, then all of your friends are going to know. Oh, that person just came over to my studio. We should. I'll tell her to come over to yours. Or oh, this gallery is showing some new work. They really are looking for people just like you. Go over there. It's about it's about being in integrated in your community of people who know. I mean, I get every piece of information, gossip to what jobs are out there, to what the next, you know, great artwork is from my friends, my colleagues. I think all the rest of us in here probably want to be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of them on Facebook. <laughs> I'm like, who is this? Anyway. Yeah, um, you mentioned earlier about um, choosing how work is displayed and up to the artist, but logistically that can't always happen, you know, like you said, the, the lead balloons. So how do you approach that situation, you know, if, if there's if there's conflict there, you know? And yeah, a contemporary, you know, back in, back in the day, a curator's job was to really work with like dead artists, and I'm talking about like the 60s and before dead artists, and they'd work on one show for like years, and then they'd contribute this tome to the field. But nowadays, curators are working with living artists more and more, and living artists' temperaments more and more. And I think what that means is that um, there's a, a curator who, who t coined the term cultural broker. Like, we're brokers. We're not only just like putting the show on the, w on the wall, we're like actually working with an artist to develop something that, like I worked with this one artist, she wanted to do in this brownstone in Brooklyn, she wanted to have the, the windows pop open and these puppets come out and then they would like perform this um, Arthur Miller play and then it would come back and then I would come, you know, and so I was on the phone like Disney animatronics or whatever those guys are called, who can we approach, Cirque du Soleil here. I, I was on the phone not just like placing work, you know, or like this artist had this metal party, it's this Bauhaus inspired party, and we had to cut out like a thousand Mylar costumes. Like, I'm like, where do I get bolts of Mylar? You know, there are things that I do that are so about production. It's almost like I'm a movie producer than an curator and with that it has to be super co cooperative with the artist a lot of times it comes down to money you know it's like well if you want to do that then you have to sh pony up the money because this is what we got you know um, a lot of times it has to do with the conditions of the space like we didn't get the permit for that so can't do it so it does depend a lot but uh, you know uh, any curator will tell you that there are great artists to work with and then there are not great artists to work with, just like any profession in the world. And that word going out like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that word, yeah. Trust me, if you want to talk, know what curators talk about, artists who they do not like working with. <laughs> There's actually a, a curator camp I go to every summer. <laughs> we talk a lot about that. Gallerists and artists. Anyway. Anything else? One more question and then. That, that um, uh, con not conference, that kind of seminar thing that you're talking about, of artists with the networking and all that, that information would be available on CAF website? The ass thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It happens once a year and it just happened. But we do have an artist opportunities uh, um, site on our page and we we put artist opportunities on there and also if you follow us on twitter and facebook um we're always constant like this we have a pumpkin carving contest and w some ucsb students once they like had a, a personal competition and there was like louis vuitton <laughs> carved it was very awesome and we invite anybody from the public and there's really awesome prizes and then there's wine tasting coon and wines is doing um uh, their varietals <coughs> tasting and it's really great and i don't know when the date is there, thank you, Joe. Um, October 28th, and it's free. Those, that's a perfect time to come and hang out with our installers, who are all artists. Hang out with um, our staff, who are all artists. Our interns, who are all artists, and and you know, become part of the community. So the one thing you can hear about talk, I guarantee you, in the 60s, a curator was also curating a famous artist and doing a pumpkin carving contest. <laughs> Things have changed, and, and what she has to do is huge and, and to run this organization Nikki 
has to know a lot about a lot of things. And I think she's done a great job. And we really appreciate Thank you, Dane. Thank you, Dane. Thank you. Thanks, guys.